I'd like to start with a very simple question. It's perhaps the oldest question ever to be asked, and it's simply, why? Why are we here? Why are we human? Why are we so special in the animal kingdom? And why can I ask that question and no other animal can? I mean, we humans are deeply curious. As children, right from the start, we begin exploring our surroundings, experimenting with the world around us, and seeking out answers to questions we didn't even know existed. Haven't you ever noticed how children will ask never-ending whys that can drive you nuts? I basically never outgrew that why phase of childhood. I'm constantly wondering why, like, I don't know, why do I have two eyes and not eight like a spider? That would be weird, right? <laughs> but that big question, why are we human? Why are we special? That's something I always come back to. But, I mean, you all know why. It's your brain. Okay, so what makes our brain so special? I mean, think about it. Right now, your brain is thinking about what makes it capable of thinking, about what makes it capable of thinking, about, okay, I'll stop, you get the idea. So basically, my brain is trying to figure itself out. It's too bad I can't just ask it why it's so special. <laughs> so I'll have to find another way. So for millennia, scientists have been dissecting and examining brains of a wide variety of different animals, including humans. And one thing is clear, the human brain is big. But it's not just that it's big, because there are other animals with larger brains, like the elephant brain, which weighs about five kilos. It's about three times bigger than the human brain. And yet most would argue that humans, the, that the human brain outweighs the elephants in terms of intelligence. So what makes a given human, like this one, so smart? <laughs> well, it turns out that it's not just size, but actually number of neurons. So the human brain actually has more neurons than an elephant in the cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for higher thinking like logic and reasoning. So to give you a sense of the scale that I'm talking about, I'd like to start by looking at a galaxy. So this is one of about 100 billion galaxies in the known universe. That's a lot of galaxies, right? But believe it or not, that is the same number of neurons in your brain right now. And what's more, in the largest galaxies, there are about a trillion stars. But that is only a hundredth of the number of neural connections in your brain. As I'm speaking, your brain is lighting up with neural activity at points of contact called synapses. This is how your brain cells communicate with one another, and it's what's responsible for your brain's enormous computing power. In this room alone, our brains combined have 60 quadrillion synapses. That's 60,000 times the number of stars in the largest galaxies, and 600,000 times the number of galaxies in the entire universe. OK, so it's clear. To understand what makes our brain special, we need to understand why it has so many neurons. Where do those neurons come from, and what determines their numbers? So for obvious reasons, we can't very well start probing a developing human brain. So early in my career, I took a pretty much standard approach of looking at brain development in rodents. And animal models have given us a number of really fundamental discoveries. Like, for example, we now know that deep inside the developing mammalian brain, including humans, neurons are generated from a special stem cell type called a neural stem cell. And scientists have been probing these neural stem cells to try to figure out what makes them tick. But the question is, why do a human's neural stem cells generate so many more neurons than those of, say, a mouse? And that's something that's always nagged at me. But how can you study one of the most fundamental questions? What makes our brain unique if you can't touch it? It's like, imagine asking a child to try to figure out how the fold-out solar panels on their toy Juno spacecraft here work, and then telling them that they can't touch it. I mean, their hand would just be twitching, wanting to fiddle with it and 
turn the crank at the back and see what happens. And that's the problem that neuroscientists have been faced with when it comes to the human brain. Okay, so we can't play with a human brain. But one way to understand the toy spacecraft is to build it. So simple, let's build a human brain. That might sound crazy, I know, but let's just think about it for a second. So when I started tackling this problem, there were a number of really key, uh, of really important technologies that had just come out. And so the first one I want to talk about are stem cells. Stem cells are really cool. Now, I know that the patchy cells at the bottom of this dish don't really look like much, but they can actually become any cell in your body. Scientists can direct them to become a wide variety of diff different tissue types, including neurons, simply by providing the right combination of different factors. And so we thought, well, maybe, just maybe, we could build our brain by starting with stem cells. But our brain isn't 2D like the cells in this dish or like many other methods for generating neurons. And so we thought, well, maybe we need to go 3D. So I spent many hours in the lab culturing stem cells in little 3D balls like the ones you see in this dish. And just like trying to build a toy spacecraft with no instructions, I had to try a lot of different things, lots of different factors and nutrients like sugars and vitamins and timing. And there were a number of previous studies that identified important components uh, in supporting brain cells. And so we tried those in combination with 3D. And the results were promising. But the real game changer came in a special protein gel that we embedded the tissues into. Now, this protein gel causes brain tissue to form with the same structure as it does in a developing embryo. It kind of acts like the supportive tissue surrounding the developing embryo. And when you combine that, with what's called a spinning bioreactor, which actually stirs the fluid and agitates the tissues, they could grow to be several millimeters in size. And so finally, we had developing human brain tissue. I mean, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so I know that many of you are probably not that familiar with what developing brain tissue should look like, so I'll try to explain. So this is what we call a brain organoid. It's an organoid because it's a lot like the organ, but not quite. I'll show you. So here's a diagram of the developing human brain, and here's our organoid. And if you were to look inside a developing human brain, what you'd see are these large fluid-filled spaces called ventricles. And there they are in our organoid as well. And lining those ventricles are the neural stem cells just like in the actual developing human brain. And if we take our organoids and we cut them up into slices and we stain them for different brain cell types, we can actually recognize different brain regions. Like, for example, at the top of this one, you can actually see a large cerebral cortex with a big fluid-filled space. That's the ventricle. And in purple, you can see the neural stem cells lining that ventricle. And on this organoid, you can actually recognize the retina, that brown tissue tear there, which is actually the neural part of the eye. But in our organoids, these different brain regions are a bit jumbled, kind of like how a toddler might try to build the toy spacecraft with the solar panels backwards and the detection equipment upside down. And that's because our brain organoids don't have the surrounding fetal tissue to help guide them. And so just like the jumbled, toddler-built toy spacecraft doesn't really lurk, work like the toy that it should, our brain organoids don't really think like a brain. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn from them, because if we focus on specific components, like, for example, the cerebral cortex, which I'm showing in a close-up here, you can see that it develops with the same organization as the brain in an actual embryo. You can see neural stem cells in red and neurons in green, and you can see that they're identical in their organization. And that's really remarkable, I think, because basically the way to build a brain in a dish is simply to direct stem cells to become neural and then allow them to do what they're programmed to do, to build a brain, simply by providing the right conditions to support and nurture the cells in a 3D configuration, the brain is able to self-organize and build itself. And that's really what it does in an embryo, if you think about it. 
And so now we have this remarkable 3D developing brain tissue that generates these really beautiful neurons, just like neurons in an actual brain. We finally have developing brain tissue that we can actually touch. We finally have something we can play with. And so what can we do with it? Well, one idea is to use it to model neurological diseases. Now, for many reasons, animals don't always make great models of neurological diseases like autism and schizophrenia. As you might imagine, it's a bit difficult to ask a mouse if it's hearing voices or to test its language abilities. <laughs> and so what we need is a human system. And that's where we think our organoids come in. A good example is the disorder microcephaly. Now, patients with this disorder have smaller brains. And it's not totally clear why, because when we try to study it in mice, they don't show much of an effect on brain size. And so we decided to take our organoid approach. So we took skin cells from this patient with microcephaly, shown here on this MRI, and we generated stem cells, and then we generated organoids. And amazingly, the organoids were smaller and had fewer neurons. And so now we had this tool to actually study this disorder and try to figure out what might be the cause. And it turns out that there was a problem with the stem cells, with the neural stem cells, that they were generating neurons too early and becoming depleted so that there weren't any left to generate new neurons. And so this gives us new insight into this disorder, but it also gives us insight into what's required for human neural stem cells to generate neurons and at what point. And so that brings me back to my big question, what determines how many neurons human neural stem cells make, and why do they generate so many? And so, so to get at that, we look at genes that we think might be important for neuron generation, and we start mutating them. And we use another really exciting new technology for this called CRISPR. CRISPR is a method for introducing specific mutations in the genetic code. It uses something called Cas9 that cuts the DNA in a specific place, like, for example, a gene important for neuron generation. And then the DNA goes back together with a mutation. And so in this way, we can introduce mutations that, that specifically disrupt genes, destroying them or introducing more mild mutations. And we can see what happens to the organoid. And so we're doing this for a number of candidate genes that we think might be important in human brain evolution. But not only that, because we're doing all of this in a dish, we can even make organoids from other animals. All we need are a few skin cells from a human and, say, a gorilla. And we can make stem cells and then organoids and compare them. And not only that, we can also watch cells in real time by labeling them, like the green neural stem cells here. And we can watch them as they generate neurons in the organoid and ask, why they generate so many more neurons, and what regulates that in humans. And so now we have this really amazing new tool. Brain organoids provide a really remarkable tool to study everything from neurological disease to human brain evolution, and hopefully one day for drug discovery and toxicity testing. But it's also a remarkable system because of its amazing ability to build itself, which is really what it does in, in an embryo. And so now we have developing human brain tissue that we can actually touch. We can take it apart, we can build it, and we can play with all of its different components. It makes me feel like a kid again, but with a grown-up question.